This video will discuss topics that may be upsetting to some viewers, including depression, mention of suicide and sexual violence. It's April 2020. Everyone is stuck inside, TV and film productions have been indefinitely postponed and people are desperate to have something to fill their time with. Enter Normal People. The show is a huge hit and streamed by millions. Then, in episode 10, we see this scene. I don't really click uh, with a lot of people. I, I struggle with that, actually. Do you think that's a new problem? Or is it familiar to you? It's uh, familiar. This show felt very necessary at a time when we were all feeling especially isolated. It dealt with themes of depression, loneliness and growing up. And there are many memorable scenes from that show, but this one in particular stands out as being important as a turning point in the story, as well as for its cultural relevance. And alongside all this, it introduced the world to Paul Meskel. After the sudden death of an old school friend, Connell has fallen into a deep depression. He's shut himself off from life and is eventually convinced by his flatmate to attend counselling. We see Connell still trying to hold his emotions back, finally break down as he pours out all his insecurities and struggles. We've already seen these feelings of isolation develop throughout the show, and when he can finally speak about it himself, it's as much a relief as it is heartbreaking. I think this scene covers a lot of what is so interesting about Paul Meskel as an actor, He's drawn to projects that tackle themes like masculinity and the modern portrayal of men on screen. Mental health is a core focus of the characters we've seen in play, and how he chooses to portray these feelings have given his characters an authentic feeling. And when we take a look at some of the characters he's played with this in mind, we start to see connections between them that are more than just the actor. I'm going to give a very simplified summary of each of the pieces I'll be talking about. Normal People is a drama that follows the on and off romance of Connell and Marianne from their first connection in school through their time in college. After Sun is about a woman remembering her final holiday with her father through the rough camcorder videos they took on the trip. And God's Creatures, set in a small coastal town in Ireland, sees how a mother will lie to protect her son who has committed a violent crime. A lot has led up to that therapy scene in Normal People. In the early episodes when Connell and Marianne are still at school, a surface level approach to the character would say he's a typical jock. He's one of the school's star footballers, has a large group of friends and girls like him. But the reality is that he constantly worries about what others think of him. The nervous way he holds himself, his timid shyness even when he's with his friends, shows a deep rooted insecurity holding him back. To the point where he can't express his real emotions in front of them for fear of being humiliated. And it's this fear that pushes him to keep his relationship with Marianne a secret, despite the fact that she's the only real friend he has. Here, his friend Eric starts to make fun of Marianne. When she talks back, Eric responds with anger, most likely a result of his own issues with self-consciousness. Oh, you think you're too good for me, do you? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Are you serious? I am. I am too good for you. Man would want to be fairly desperate before he'd go near you. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Ugly, flat-chested bitch. Connell can do nothing but sit there and listen. He's too afraid of being an outcast like Marianne that he can't even call his friends out on behaviour he's clearly not okay with. This fear ends up ruining his relationship with her. He asks another girl to their devs, breaking Marianne's heart. She doesn't go to the devs at all and... Clearly having a bad time there, the last straw is when Rob shows him intimate photos that his girlfriend sent him. Nothing gets a bit fucked up showing pictures of your girlfriend like that. She's just there waving at you. He's outside later when Eric mentions that it's a pity Marianne didn't come and asks Connell what was going on with them. I'm sure everyone knows. Right. Was it going on for long? Yeah. <laughs> what was the story there? Are you doing it for the laugh or what? He's devastated by the realisation that it really wouldn't have mattered if he told everyone about the relationship and he didn't have to hurt her that way at all. It's only then, while also drunk, that he can actually confess to Marianne how sorry he is 
and at that it's only over a voicemail. He tells her he loves her again, but even during this heartfelt confession, Meskel's performance gives us the feeling that Connell already knows it's too late. One of my favourite things about Callum is that for everything that's going on behind the scenes, I think he's an excellent father. Charlie's construction of Callum is so wonderfully smart because I feel like we've seen many neglectful, absent, single fathers. In a binary. They're yeah, either, totally. Yeah. They're, they're like one thing. And Callum is a single father. I feel like he jumps between jobs, but he the thing that he is best at is being a dad to Sophie. Callum can be overprotective of Sophie. He teaches her self-defence, showing good intentions and trying to teach an important skill, but he gets very pushy. It's as though he's become totally focused on this one thing in the moment, and isn't seeing how he's upsetting her. Something else we see throughout the film is that he's treating her like she's a bit older than she is. He's recommending her books that are too advanced and trying to make her dive in the water when she doesn't feel confident, with a level of focus and pushiness that makes the viewer feel uneasy but there's a more internal struggle Callum is trying to keep down. Even so, it's always clear that Callum loves Sophie and she's the most important thing in his life. Everything he does, even when it goes wrong, comes from a place of either trying to care for her or give her a better life. Although they have very different stories, Connell's struggle isn't unlike Callum's in Aftersun. As the film progresses, it becomes clear that Callum is suffering from depression. The early signs show his difficulty sleeping and general lethargic feeling throughout the day. He falls asleep often or slips into a bit of a daydream type state. The way he carries himself gets across the feeling of fatigue that comes to a head when he's going scuba diving and needs help from the instructor to get his wetsuit on. Callum appears lighthearted and laughs, but I think that this physical struggle with a small thing helps to show this feeling of something that is about to boil over. A small issue with a simple solution is even too much for him to bear. And what follows is the first explicit statement of his depression. I can't see myself before it, to be honest. I'm surprised I made it to 30. Now, looking back at the scene where he tries to teach Sophie to defend herself, it's different. He's putting all the energy he has left into being a good dad and trying to teach her as much as he can because he doesn't really think he'll be around in the future. Another common factor in Callum and Connell's stress is their lack of financial stability. Connell needs somewhere to stay for the summer after losing his job and his room, and he'd like to ask Marianne if he could stay with her. Her family is very well off and owns a flat in Dublin, but his pride won't let him ask for help. So you'll be going back to Sligo then? I guess, I guess you want to see other people or... Uh... I guess so, yeah. Despite his confidence improving and Connell being in a better place, his old fear of rejection creeps in and prevents him from clearly communicating with her. Later, they both realise that this fight was a complete misunderstanding, but both are already seeing other people. So Connell feels he's missed out on happiness yet again because he couldn't figure out a way to save what he was really feeling. As a father, Callum feels pressure to provide the best life for his daughter. It's established early on that he doesn't have much money and that this is a source of shame for him. He becomes fixated on this rug that's priced well outside his budget. He struggles with it, contemplates, but goes back to buy it anyway. I think in some ways, this is the first sign that Callum has really given up and no longer cares about losing money. In both cases, we're dealing with men who've been taught it's weak to ask for help. Struggling with money is something to be embarrassed about and men are supposed to be able to provide for their family. But all this worry does for them is put more distance between them and the people they love. God's Creatures sees Meskel pursue a very different type of character. Brian is the prodigal son returned to a small, patriarchal town in Ireland. He's welcomed with open arms, despite the fact that his move abroad and sudden return seem very mysterious. His mother can't bring herself to question any of it in case it ruins the happy reunion. But we can kind of see why she's so blinded by her love for him. 
It seems like Brian is a charming guy and friends with everyone. But it becomes clear that this dynamic is not unique in the town. Women are expected to put up with the men's behaviour and a mob of hostility forms when Brian is accused of assault by his ex-girlfriend Sarah. Brian's own sister believes her, but Sarah is generally ostracised from the community. Despite seeming like a popular guy, the only real connection Brian has is with his grandfather, who himself is a symbol of the patriarchal nature of the town. There's nothing wrong with you, Paddy, mate. <laughs> You're only playing a trick on the rest of us. Since Brian has never been taught the consequences of his actions, it's not surprising that he shows no remorse for what he's done to Sarah. Even when his mother finally realises the mistake she's made and confronts him, he can only blame her for how he's turned out. Does it mean absolutely nothing to you? Is there no hurt or feeling in you? Jesus Christ! You have this impossible image of me, Aileen. Brian is different from the other two characters we've looked at. But a common theme here is the idea that difficult subjects and feelings are just not discussed. The idea of educating the people of this town about things like consent or abuse is just not something that would happen in that society. The film begins with a young man, one of the many oyster farmers in the town, who drowns when going out on the boat to work, because they don't teach their sons how to swim. The result is generations of men who accept no responsibility and have no respect for women. Brian's mother spends the film unable to confront the reality of who her son is, and when she finally does, we get a still tragic but inevitable ending. Connell and Callum are unable to discuss the struggles they're having with their mental health. This leads to Connell sabotaging his life repeatedly and Callum losing all hope for the future. Callum or Connell, for example, and normal people, when the filmmakers or the script doesn't explain to you what and why they're feeling a certain way, and it requires a kind of restraint from the filmmakers and also from a performance side of things to kind of show, don't tell. One thing that never really changes about Connell is that he's a man of few words. Even when he eventually learns to communicate his feelings, he doesn't really speak unless he has something to say. For some actors, this would be a difficult thing to balance. But Mescal brings such depth to the performance that, as an audience, we can read between the lines. When Connell and Marianne reunite in Dublin, they rekindle their friendship. But Connell can't move forward without confronting his past behaviour, having realised that no one would have been bothered about them being together anyway. I feel really guilty about all that stuff I said to you about uh, how bad it would be if people found out. Like, obviously, that was just... That was just what was going on in my head. And there'd be no reason why anybody would care. I just... I think I just suffer from anxiety with those sort of things. I don't know. It's... We can see he has a lump in his throat and how he struggles to steady his breathing. It feels like Connell is about to burst, but he's fighting so hard to keep the emotion in. While he manages to get his apology out, you can't help but feel there's so much more he still has to say. I think it's fair to say he's developed these skills even further in Aftersun. As I said before, Callum has a lot of inner turmoil, but he struggles to express it, and usually just avoids the subject. In a truly devastating scene, after refusing to join Sophie for the tradition of terrible karaoke, he tries to avoid the awkwardness by suggesting singing lessons. Stop doing that. Doing what? Offering to pay for something when I know you don't have the money. Meskel says so much here with few actual lines. Callum opens his mouth once, then twice, like he wants to say something but he just falls short. Guilt and shame wash over him, as he realises his daughter can see through some of the facade he's working so hard to build. He tries to laugh it off for a second, but he realises he can't just change the subject this time. While a lot of these performances require restraint in the form of characters hiding what they're feeling, there are moments where we can see something a bit more unstable bubbling under the surface. Connell shows a rare bit of anger towards Marianne when they talk after school. 
She's trying to make him realise he's better than his friends, but she brings up the subject of a teacher who shows Connell a lot of extra attention. Does she fancy you or something? Why did you say that? God, you're not having an affair with her, are you? I think it's funny joking about stuff like that, do you? Sorry? People going at me like I fancy her. I don't fancy her. Clearly this has been bothering Connell, but as he gets angry he starts to stammer. And when I say angry, he doesn't even raise his voice. But Mescal gets the deeper feelings of anger or embarrassment across in this quiet performance. So it feels like it still fits Connell, while also teaching us something new about him. That he can't really confront or acknowledge feelings of anger when they arise. On the other hand, most of Callum's anger is directed inward, towards himself. After they've spent the day out on the boat, Sophie expresses that she still sometimes feels down, even after a great day. And then you come home and feel tired and down and it feels like your bones don't work. They're just tired and everything is tired. Like you're sinking. I don't know. It's weird. The camera stays tight on Callum as we see him processing that his daughter might have some of the same feelings he has. We know it's normal to feel depressed sometimes, and it seems healthy and mature of Sophie to be able to articulate it at all. But for someone like Callum, who carries around so much shame as it is, he sees this as another failure of his. Has he somehow passed on his mental health problems to his daughter, and is this what he'll leave her with when he's gone? These rare moments where the characters let the mask slip a little bit are more impactful for how restrained the majority of the performance is. This might be most clear in God's Creatures. Part of what makes Brian feel so dangerous is the skill with which Paul Meskel can show the different sides of a character. His public personality is friendly and open most of the time, if sometimes a bit cold, but Meskel gives off a very endearing charm that wins both the townspeople and the audience over. In the beginning, anyway. But the times when he lets this disguise slip, the moments when you're alone with him and realise you've been tricked... Mescal and the film have lied to you about Brian. The opening scenes don't give you any sense of the true nature of this character. It's scary, and it's what makes his mother confront her own mistakes in the end. What are you talking about? Fuck's sake, who do you think I am at all, man? Uh, put the on your mother. Trusting an audience to be smart and with you and kind of front-footed in their response to what they're seeing. I believe that's true of normal people as a show and after Sun, I feel like they're in a kind of similar yet incredibly different wheelhouse, you know. Now we can see how Mescal portrays these common themes so well through his particular style of performance. But what makes him a really interesting actor to me is that he seems to be very drawn to these projects because of the inner lives of their characters. These men are in a constant fight to hide how they really feel, to protect those around them, or to get away with something. Our perspective on masculinity is changing, thankfully, and that doesn't mean that I necessarily want to play virtuous characters at all. In fact, I don't really have an interest in playing good people but I think that I am definitely interested in playing characters that have a rich inner emotional life. And up until now, a lot of that has been a sad inner emotional life. I hope he continues this trend because he's exploring topics that are extremely important, like toxic masculinity, men's mental health and sexual assault. Of course, this isn't the first time anyone has done this, but his performances feel very grounded in reality. And I think that's why they're so memorable and have already made such a difference for a lot of people. These are heavy topics to talk about. Brian in God's Creatures is an evil person, and I think this film is a cautionary tale about the outcome of such a poorly educated, inconsiderate environment for people to grow up in. The lack of communication, understanding and knowledge of issues such as consent create a person like Brian, who's capable of truly horrible things. After Sun is a heartbreaking story about a man who feels like there's no way out of his situation, despite trying so hard to help himself. It's a very sympathetic and understanding portrayal, which is part of why it's such a unique film. Everyone can empathise with Connell's struggles. 
That's why normal people really struck a nerve when it came out. It was a time of uncertainty, loss of direction and fear for a lot of us. Connell's loneliness and not knowing who he is felt very relatable. But that's not the end of the story, and there is a positive message that can be taken from Mescal's work. And I think the best example of this I showed at the beginning of the video. I can never go back. <laughs> because those friendships are gone and... <laughs> and Rob is gone and I can't, I can't see him again. I can't get that life back. I'm sorry. <laughs> you don't need to apologise. This scene is a turning point for Connell. It's a release of all the emotion, struggles and feelings he doesn't fully understand yet. Now it's not all smooth sailing from here. He receives an opportunity to go to New York to study and the fear of this is still weighing him down and leaves us uncertain on whether Connell and Marianne will end up together. But if this happened earlier in the show, there'd be dread and sadness looming over it. That's not the case. Instead, we're left with a bittersweet hope for the future. We don't know what'll happen to Connell and Marianne, and that's okay. Meskel's work is an examination of masculinity and mental health. He's drawn to complex and not always good characters, who start conversations about serious problems in our society through deeply personal stories. Hopefully this signals a bigger change in the direction of how these issues will continue to be explored. Bally. Harness. Bally harness. 